And I just, I, it baffles me how many industry professionals right now are so comfortable publicly on their social media accounts, on their website saying, hey, if you want to work with me and you write about a gay character, you'd better be able to prove to me that you're gay or it ain't happening. That is so gross. I have to start this video out with a disclaimer because since I made my last video on this topic, which I will link up here, I have received a lot of comments, but also a lot of emails from you guys um, asking me for my advice on this topic. And while I'm incredibly flattered that you trust me enough and value my opinion enough to ask for it, I really wanna make it clear that I'm not speaking here from like any kind of position of authority. I can't tell you for sure what is the best thing to do and the way to approach this. I am an author and I am an editor for a book packager, yes, but this is all just my opinion and I'm going to give you my honest opinion. But in the end, I, I know this is like stating the obvious, but I really want you to ultimately follow your gut when it comes to what you want to write about and what you choose to disclose about your personal self to an editor, an agent, or anyone else. Okay, so a few weeks ago, I received an email and I shared part of that email in that video to start getting some feedback from you guys and just, I wanted to create a longer video that wasn't just my opinion, but that included your opinions as well. So I think I got all of the comments from that video. They are worked in throughout this video. Here is the email I received, which I'm gonna share in full with permission. I'm writing you to ask a question about some advice that I've seen regarding authors who write about characters from marginalized identities. I recently saw a video in which you gave this advice and it has always been something I struggle with. In the video, Why Literary Agents Reject Query Letters, 12 Mistakes to Avoid, you say, especially if you are writing a protagonist with a marginalized identity that you yourself do not share, ask yourself, why am I really doing this? Am I really the best person to tell this story? My question is about the second question. What is an author supposed to do if the answer is no? Like, I'm probably not the best person to tell this story, but it's a story that has merit. I am the one who is writing it, so am I supposed to find someone else to write it? Or is the implication that the story should just be shelved if it can't be told by a person from that identity? I am asking this sincerely. I'm really struggling with some imposter syndrome here. I am a cisgender queer person, but my protagonist is a trans woman. In addition to being partnered to a trans person, I have been advocating for trans healthcare at my place of employment and am deeply enmeshed in queer advocacy. I've also been working with four trans women who are sensitivity readers for this book, and all of them have had glowing feedback for me and are eager to see it published. But at the end of the day, I'm cisgender. If I'm being honest, I'm not the best person to tell the story of a trans woman. And that question, am I really the best person to tell this story, keeps me up at night. Especially when I see agents specifically say that they are looking for authors who are from marginalized identities. I'm from a marginalized identity, but not the most marginalized identity that is featured in my book. If I query this book to them, will I be implying that I am a trans woman when I am not? Do I need to include a caveat that I am a bisexual woman, like my protagonist, but cisgender, unlike my protagonist? It feels uncomfortable to talk about my own gender and sexuality in a query letter, but I don't know how else to approach this. I guess what I'm asking is, if my answer is no, I'm not the best person to write this book, but nobody else is writing it, then how do I proceed from there? So this person and I have since corresponded more, and they gave me permission to include a few more of their thoughts that they had after my first video went up. One thing I just wanted to mention is that one of the comments said something about it being a misconception that trans authors weren't telling their own stories already, that those stories are being told, they just aren't getting published, and so we don't see them on the shelves. Just in case, I wanted to clarify that when I say nobody else is telling the story, I'm not saying that nobody else is telling stories about trans people. I mean quite literally that nobody else is telling this story, the one in my head that hasn't been written down yet. The story centers a trans woman and her identity as a trans person is important to how she experiences the events that unfold, but my goal isn't just to get a trans story out into the world, it's to get this story out into the world. But so many of the comments brought up the excellent point that publishers see an identity and think of it as being a that identity book. So if I write a story featuring a trans person, am I necessarily taking away an opportunity from a trans author to tell a story that would, by the mere fact that they have lived the experience, be more authentic? And I think her last paragraph there, her last statement about how publishers see an identity and think this is that identity book, that's where we need to start. If we're gonna talk about why own voices 
is even a thing to begin with. It's easy to look at this question today and just say, you know, why can't we just judge a book based on the quality of the writing? Or as Victoria said, I think all authors should just be completely anonymous and have no socials and no author bios or photos at the end of their books and no public appearances. That way books would be evaluated by their merit only. I think that would be very nice. Let's try that for a little bit and see how it goes. And yes, judging a book completely based off the quality of the writing and the storytelling, that is the ideal. But we have to realize here that own voices didn't just like spring up out of the ground unprompted one day. It was a reaction to decades and decades of exclusion. And even today with the rise of own voices and we need diverse books and all of these movements, there are still everyday examples of authors and books being othered and that othering often resulting in rejection. I remember back when my first novel came out, this was in 2014, I was in a forum with other authors who debuted around that time and one of them told a story about how this was not her first submission. She had written another book that was never published. So I guess we're talking about 2012 somewhere in that time. A while ago but in the you know history of publishing not that long ago and she told a story about how a lot of editors were interested in it but ultimately rejected and several of them said we really love this, but we already have a book about an Asian American kid on our list this year. Now, the issue with saying this is obvious because we all know that no editor has ever said, sorry, we love this, but we already have a book about a white kid on our list this year. The othering, the tokenism has always been present. The people who want to deny this at this point, I think, are just sticking their heads in the sand. And I don't think they're the people who are watching my videos anyway, so I'm not going to preach to the choir about why that is obviously wrong. I will say this. In the last uh, like five, six, seven years, I have had private conversations with some authors who are, I don't want to say not marginalized, but like largely white, straight authors, okay, who are self-proclaimed progressive and or liberal people and they're not I wouldn't I won't say that they're coming to me complaining about the current publishing focus on diversity but they're just kind of like well this is not my time because that's all editors want right now and we're gonna get into this a little bit more later I'm not here to bash on these people your perception is your perception and I can't take that away from you I will say if you want to make yourself feel better and like actually just see objective fact, you can go to Publishers Weekly every single week to see the latest book deals. They are announced every Tuesday and on Publishers Weekly they usually post, you know, a blurb, a synopsis of the book along with a photo of the author and you can see for yourself that every single day there are <laughs> white authors who are being published and straight authors who are being published and stories that are about white straight people being published. I feel I'm laughing saying this because it seems very obvious but I do I do think that sometimes yes publishers are very proudly touting when they they publish a diverse title and they're patting themselves on the back and again we can get into that later but the objective fact is you know white straight authors are being published and stories about white straight characters are still being published so never fear if that is your concern it is objectively not true. I understand what's happening here because if you think of you know inequality as a seesaw and some of us are up here and some of us are down here if you've been up here and you want equality when it starts to happen you might perceive if you're only looking at yourself that you're going down or being oppressed in some way you really need to pull back and look at what's happening here and realize that no this is just us working our way towards an actual level playing field which i know again for the vast majority of you who have watched my videos is what ultimately we all want that's why i wanted to start way back with what how things used to be in publishing because you have to look at where we started and not 
base your entire perception of this off your singular experience. But again, these authors who have expressed these concerns to me, I get where they're coming from. And no, please, nobody think that I'm sitting here saying white straight authors can't catch a break nowadays. That is not what I'm saying. Publishing has undoubtedly made diversity and own voices as a trend, which is a huge issue that this video is going to get much more into in a little bit here. The authors who are complaining about this, I have not heard actual resentment from them or I don't perceive resentment towards the marginalized authors whose books are being published. To them it's more, the, the vibe I get is that they're, it's like they're saying, well, I really want to write a vampire romance but that's not in right now so I guess it's just not my time. <laughs> Again, because the issue is that diversity is being treated as a trend. But diversity is not a trend. It is just a very basic reality of the world we live in. Trends die, or at least they go away and then they come back. Having an industry that is reflective and that publishes books that are reflective of the reality of our world, that's not a trend. Or at least it shouldn't be. This comment said it best. This Magic House says, Publishers are dumping the diversity issue onto authors because they are not diverse themselves. If they had people from diverse backgrounds reading the books and able to recognize authenticity, they would not need authors to disclose their backgrounds if they do not want to. A lot of the controversy over the past few years that has led to the own stories push, which started out with very good intentions, but often turns toxic, was because of books like American Dirt, about Mexican migrants and written by a white woman. When Mexicans who had immigrated to the U.S. read it, they noted how weird some of the characterizations were. Because there was no diversity in the publishing process for the book, they were blindsided by the backlash. I would argue that if someone can write a character who is not like themselves in a way that people who do have that lived experience feel is authentic, then there is no problem. The problem comes when people write about other experiences in an inauthentic way that ends up harming the community presented. And for that to be determined requires a diverse staff at publishing houses. I have said this numerous times in past videos and I will keep saying it till I am blue in the face. The actual issue of the lack of diversity in publishing houses will never be fully addressed until these publishers start offering salaries that are actual livable wages for where they are based, which is mostly Manhattan, and make it so that people, potential editors, marketing experts, publicity experts, etc., who do not have some kind of financial support system can apply for and get these jobs. The example from that comment of American Dirt is really good. When a book featuring a racially marginalized character is read only by white editors, their blind spots will often mean that they miss seeing potentially harmful stereotypes or misconceptions or just a bad portrayal of this particular community in the book. Having a more diverse staff will lead to better quality books period. And as this commenter pointed out, a lot of editors are well aware of this, but now they're so afraid they can't assess the authenticity of a story themselves, they demand the author show their receipts out of fear of the potential backlash. So yes, cancel culture has entered the chat. A topic for a separate video, but here is the Cliff Notes version of my opinion on cancel culture. People in positions of power deserve to be held accountable for harmful words or actions. Frequently, they are not. As a result, out of frustration, online mobs form to vilify not quite so powerful people for things they said or did in the past, with little to no consideration for how they might have evolved and even repented since then. Because if we can't take down those select few powerful jerks who are actually passing laws that are actively hurting people and making the world an objectively worse place, we can make ourselves feel better by destroying the life of an influencer who tweeted something offensive six years ago and call it progress. Books and authors get cancelled all the time, and I'm not even talking about cancel culture now. I mean like, books are getting cancelled because announcements come out and the mob comes before having ever read the book. And look, I'm an editor, and to my fellow editors I say, this is on us. If we can assess the quality of a book from the perspective of a serial killer, or a dragon, or a dog, and deem it worthy of publication, surely we can do the same for stories told from the perspective of human beings who are of a different orientation or race than our own. And if we fail, surely we can own that and grow and not use authors and sensitivity readers as a shield. Speaking of sensitivity readers... 
Okay, hear me out. I am not saying we should not use sensitivity readers. I'm not saying that they can't be extremely useful and valuable. What I am saying is that they are not the solution to this larger issue. Now, I have always been in the camp of authenticity readers have always been a thing. Just in terms of an author writing about a character who is outside of their own experience in some way and going, hey, I wonder if I got this right, and asking somebody else to read it and give them feedback, that is a thing authors have done since authors have existed. The issue here, and when I say sensitivity readers, I am talking about the way publishers are using them nowadays as a shield. That is both unfair to the author and the sensitivity reader. And in a lot of cases, not through the fault of the sensitivity reader, they aren't actually effective at identifying the harmful stereotypes that it might exist in the story. This will be one of the many links I include below, but I recently read a very interesting article on sensitivity readers in Writers Unboxed. Alberto Galaba Jr. wrote a novel titled University Thugs about a black ex-convict who, after his release from prison, enrolls in a predominantly white university. His agent was thrilled with the novel, and to help with marketing asked Galaba about his own ethnic background. Golaba told his agent he was Filipino, and the agent's enthusiasm promptly cooled. He requested that Golaba submit the manuscript to one of the agent's staff members who was black. One little problem, she had been born in the Caribbean and raised in the UK. How she had any greater authority than the author to speak for a black American male ex-convict remains unclear. In the end, the agent withdrew his representation, and Gulaba published the novel independently and pseudonymously. That agent was excited about that book? until he learned the author's race. Which tells me, among other things, this agent does not trust his own gut. Then passing it off to a black staff member who actually could not speak to the black American ex-convict experience any more than I could, is wild. It's ignorant. That agent was not looking for an actual critique of that book. He was looking for a shield. And as a side note, I would bet that staff member was not paid at all for the extra labor she did. And that isn't even the worst anecdote from this article. Unfortunately, the horror stories are not limited to what has happened to writers. In an anonymous piece titled, I was a sensitivity reader until I realized why I was hired, the anonymous author recounts how she was recruited by a senior editor because she, the author, was working class, had overcome difficulties with alcohol, and had experienced both domestic abuse and mental health issues. She was part of a team assembled due to similar backgrounds. Quote, the sensitivity readers were all under 30. There was even someone who had started as an editorial assistant who was still in her late teens. When I met the rest of the team, I realized we had all been recruited because we had some form of trauma. Whether it be abuse, addiction, or issues around sexuality or race, we were all somehow drawing from our previous suffering. One had a history of self-harm. In hindsight, it felt like manipulation of young, impressionable employees who were being paid less than 20,000 pounds a year to effectively reopen old wounds and safeguard the reputation of the publisher." End quote. It's difficult not to come away with the sense that this preoccupation with language and sensitivity is an escape hatch, policing speech rather than engaging in the far more difficult tasks of pursuing real diversity and opportunity for marginalized individuals, communities, and writers. You know that thing where white people are more afraid of being called racist than they are actually concerned about actual racism? That's the vibe I'm getting here. And when people are more afraid of being called blankist or blankphobic than they are invested in actually addressing those issues, that is when we end up with using both authors and their identities and sensitivity readers and their identities as shields for ourselves. EJ says, that question is absolutely heartbreaking. When I was querying literary agents, I got rejections essentially because I'm not the right kind of author from a minority background. I'm black, female, and very disabled. A few agents told me there was no market for my kind of characters. Reading between the lines, I got the impression that the nature of my disability, seizures, occasional paralysis, cognitive issues, is alienating. Even though some of these agents could swallow their discomfort, because I don't want my personal medical history, near-death experiences, used as a marketing ploy, that's when I became unmarketable. 
My agent was mortified when I told her. I personally believe that publishing was convenient diversity, stories that are on the surface diverse, but not deep enough to cause the majority white publishing infrastructure discomfort. It's an unfortunate reality, made worse by the fact that minority authors don't get the best marketing support. Publishing is happy to promote a few and praise themselves from putting in the effort. This will be an issue as long as there are people in publishing who don't want to be challenged or see the world through different eyes. For context, I live in the UK and queried US and UK agents. Our situation on the ground is nothing like the US. Since the US is the biggest market, we are digesting issues not reflective of our reality. I wish we lived in a world where the content of the story mattered more than the author. If someone has taken the time and done the research to write these beautiful stories in a sensitive and caring manner, it's better than no story. Just because people may be in the minority doesn't mean they no longer exist. MT says, as a queer person, I absolutely understand the need for stories about marginalized identities being written by people with the lived experience, but disclosure of sensitive information should not be a barrier for entry in an industry that already treats marginalized authors like crap. Own voices got weaponized to hell, which is so frustrating. I care much more about the angle an author chooses to approach a queer character from than what they identify as. Willingness to deconstruct bias is key, no matter which perspective you're building a story from. Now let's talk about inclusivity statements that we are increasingly seeing on agent and editors, websites, and manuscript wish lists. Most of these, I would say, are, in my opinion, fine. They will say something along the lines of, we welcome submissions from and about XYZ marginalized communities. And that's it. It's like akin to a company's diversity statement. They are simply acknowledging, hey, our industry doesn't have the best track work record or history of being inclusive and we're aware of that and we're mindful and attempting to do better. Okay, there are no problems detected there. But what I'm seeing and what a lot of you have been emailing me have been seeing increasingly is editors and agents who are like lumping this into their wish lists of things they want to see in their inbox. I'd love to see vampire romance, space operas, psychological horror, the next Graceling, and stories from BIPOC, LGBTQIA, and disabled communities. To me, this is like not a red flag, but maybe like a pink flag, because yes, some of them are just virtue signaling. That is a thing, I'm sorry. But a lot of them, I, I truly believe it is coming from a good place, okay? But even if it is coming from a good place, a well-meaning place, slotting these people and communities into your list of genres and trends that you want to see right now tells me on some level you do see it as a trend. I also, and look, I really don't have the authority to speak from this place, but I do have a right to my opinion. If you guys think I am wrong, please call me out in the comments below, it's fine. But I also perceive this to be othering. Like, okay, I'm not actually talking about, for example, a white author looking at this and saying, oh, they only want stories from BIPOC people, so I guess I'm out. I'm sure there are people who feel that way, but that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about BIPOC people or whoever from these marginalized communities, how they might feel about seeing these statements and seeing their communities lumped into genres. Because it doesn't make any sense. You know, you might have, and I'm sure we do have, BIPOC people writing about vampire romances or people from the LGBT community, you know, writing a space opera. Maybe a person with a disability is writing the next Graceling. It feels like the agent or editor doesn't see it that way. All of these genres and trends are probably being written by non-marginalized people, and all of the marginalized people must be writing only about their own experience. Again, I don't think consciously agents and editors are seeing it this way, but I kind of lightly perceive it that way. If you think I'm wrong, tell me I'm wrong. <laughs> but I, I would imagine that there are at least some marginalized people out there who look at these kind of statements and feel some kind of twinge of, what? <laughs> River says, preach. I'm sick and tired of publishing only wanting queer stories they can neatly package for the Pride Month or black stories they can sell for Black History Month or POC people only existing in stories about racism or in some tourist destination version of their culture. Look at Asian fantasy as a whole. In some genres, it's getting better. In some authors, are still asked, is there a plot reason you made your protagonist this race? There doesn't need to be a plot reason to be straight, white, or any other dominant majority. 
It annoys me every time I see things like the recent London Fair saying that LGBTQ stories are trending or we want queer joy. Don't turn people into a trend. It's also sad when we have some marginalizations that aren't trendy or flashy, especially stories about disability, chronic illness, mental illness, and neurodivergence aren't something you can drown in rainbows and hang on a flag. Therefore, we're not marketable. There's also a lot of stereotypes how neurodivergent authors are hard to work with or need special accommodations, and how neurodivergent characters are not relatable or hard to connect to. Then we get maybe a darker pink flag in the form of agents or editors who say something along the lines of no submissions about marginalized characters unless its own voices. And again, what that tells me is that this agent or editor does not trust their own gut on assessing the quality and authenticity of a story, which is kind of our whole job. As the email I shared at the beginning of this video illustrates, this leads to confusion, fear, and doubt among marginalized authors. Because what qualifies here? What if you are a marginalized author, but you're not marginalized in the exact way that your protagonist is? What if you're queer or trans, but you're not willing to disclose that, maybe even out of concern for your own safety? What if you have an invisible disability or mental illness and you don't want to share that information with a literal stranger, much less commit to talking about it publicly in the event your book is published. Does this agent or editor require a doctor's note, medical records, a urine sample, and a complete psychological evaluation as well? Do they not see how this kind of statement is actively driving away the marginalized voices they claim to want to uplift? It's not inclusive, it is exclusive. And I'm really starting to wonder how long it's going to be before someone takes some kind of legal action. The U.S. Equal Employment Opportunity Commission, EEOC, enforces federal laws prohibiting discrimination against a job applicant or an employee during a variety of work situations, including hiring, firing, promotions, training, wages, and benefits. The federal laws currently in place in the United States include those that make it illegal to discriminate against someone on the basis of race, color, religion, national origin, sex, pregnancy, childbirth, medical conditions related to pregnancy or childbirth, gender, age, and disabilities. So let me state the obvious up front. The agent-author and the editor-author relationship is not an employer-employee relationship. So I know that all of these federal laws that are currently in place in the United States do not apply here. And I am far from a legal expert, okay? But it's not hard for me to imagine a scenario where a marginalized author is coerced in a in documented emails into revealing some private part of their identity to an agent for a book deal. If that author has a real good lawyer and the parameters of the situation are just right, I just, I feel like I, I can see something coming of that one day. And I just, I, it baffles me how many industry professionals right now are so comfortable publicly on their social media accounts, on their website saying, hey, if you want to work with me and you write about a gay character, you'd better be able to prove to me that you're gay or it ain't happening. That is so gross. <laughs> and it's not just about authors getting representation or getting a book deal, but this extends into their marketing plans, publicity, the reviews the book gets, awards for which it's considered. You know, I can't help but think when Dan Brown comes out with a book, the marketing, the reviews, the buzz about it, it's going to be about the story. No doubt they will be talking about the super fast pacing, the depth of research that he did on whatever, you know, he decided to explore in this book, all the, the cast of characters, the twists and turns, and all the things that Dan Brown novels are known for. In other words, it's all going to be about the story that he wrote and the quality of it. But I see a lot of marketing plans and reviews that are so hyper-focused on the author and or character's marginalized identity that that's, that's the whole point of it. And it's like, sometimes that is the point of the book, especially if we're talking about memoirs, but it just, it feels to me like it's so disrespectful to those authors to put that as the, the focal point instead of actually talking about what we should be talking about, which is their writing, their storytelling skills, the characters in the world that they created. Like, 
Again, this feels very othering to me. It honestly baffles me that so many professionals who are, again, largely self-proclaimed progressive and or liberal people would do this, but they're doing this. This is happening. Louisa says, the person who emailed you and was brave enough to raise this question deserves our thanks. I'm just watching a webinar to launch an award for new writers for children over here in the UK. And the very nice people with really good intentions running it have just said that those submitting an entry should briefly outline their lived experience with regard to what they are writing about. I'm not sure anyone is properly thinking through the consequences of asking writers to do this. I think it's deeply problematic. River says, there's a sense of worry, especially among authors with neurodivergence, autism, ADHD, etc., mental health issues, chronic is illnesses or disabilities, that disclosing these will cause subconscious biases to emerge, stigmatize them, make agents and editors, publishers consider it a downside, they won't meet deadlines, will need special accommodations that are too much trouble, will have problems communicating, won't attend events. So it's going to be shooting yourself in the foot to disclose and lowering your chances. Basically, will publishing weaponize people's marginalizations against them when disclosed? Sue says, this is such a great video topic. I stopped querying after only sending a couple of letters because of this reason. Not knowing how to handle it made my queries stiff and impersonal. There was just no way to feel comfortable with the amount of disclosure needed about my personal life, and I also struggled with the lack of opportunity to explain what I was pitching in the required format. I found someone to represent me in my own circle, and if it works out, we want to do this for others in the same situation. I once wrote a pitch that makes me feel icky to this day, more than a year later, and I never even received a reply while they asked for more personal details than even many members of my family are having. Caitlin says, as I'm currently querying, this is something I debated including in my query letter. I ended up going with, as part of the LGBT plus community myself, I hope to have representation in all of my stories. It's not too specific, but hints at it. I feel comfortable sharing that part of me. Not everyone does. Yet I felt I had to include it because of that pressure. Raven says, I've been noticing more and more agents that I have been considering querying have grown more and more specific about who they want to work with and what book they want to see. They want trans characters, even though that's not necessarily everyone's thing. They want unvoices novels, even though there are plenty of great novels and movies and shows that depict very rich and nuanced characters that aren't the same identity as the creators themselves. For context, I've been working on novels and short stories about female Native Americans, often religious or at least spiritual characters, but these agents I look up to, they're not interested in Natives at all. They all just want stories about Black or trans experiences or both, and one even demanded a book that is against, quote, established religion. Joey says, I do feel like it shouldn't matter, and you shouldn't have to disclose things about yourself, especially with the laws and such that make it unsafe. CR says, as a queer author, I'm not happy that LGBT is now trending in publishing because of how it's trending. I'm pleased that publishing is becoming more open to tell our stories, but I'm not happy that they are forcing us out of the closet to tell our stories by, by contributing to the commodification of identity. Publishing has taken identities that do not belong to them and made them trends. At some point, they are going to have to accept that and actually dismantle the system they continue to perpetuate, as well as actually put BIPOC, Jewish, queer, neurodivergent, and disabled people in positions of higher power. It's very upsetting to be queer and neurodivergent and see a cishet agent say, I'm only accepting authentic stories. Who is this agent to judge my authenticity? I would never in a million years do this to them. And that is something that agents are going to have to reconcile with. They are not good judges of what kind of stories need to be told for communities they are not a part of. The only thing they can be a judge of is if they personally want to read that story and fine if they don't. No skin off my nose, no matter how frustrating it is. But that's the key difference. They are in a position of power and they have to recognize it and decide if they are willing to push themselves further and give a chance to tropes or ideas that they might not initially be interested in and be open to having their minds changed or they can stick with what they like, but also stop with this authenticity stuff. They are not good judges of it. I also have a problem with the cost of sensitivity readers being pushed onto authors. Times have changed. Publishing needs to start hiring freelancer sensitivity readers, pay them properly and take on the monetary burden if they are actually committed to doing the right thing. It's going to make it even harder for authors who don't come from wealth to get published. Telling a cishet author that they just shouldn't be writing queer characters isn't the right answer because, as a queer person, cishet people have a responsibility to actually learn and do better and take in our stories and how we want them to be told, and then write queer characters so queerness is always present on the shelf, even if it's not marketed as a queer book. I also say this as a neurodivergent author, and I've heard this from my friends of color as well. Identity stories are not the same thing as the main character being of an identity, and we need to have stories where our identities are normalized, too. 
Identity shouldn't be a trend. It should always be on the shelf and being published. Asian fantasy and black sci-fi and demisexual romance and autistic thrillers should be constantly pushed out because the writing is good and the story is good. And maybe we're in a period where we have to do this to get there. I don't know. Maybe this is growing pains before we get to the ideal. But even if it is, it sucks in the moment. And this goes further because agents and editors and publishing as a whole have been picking and choosing the tropes they like. Last year, every single call from publishing I saw for a sapphic historical romance was, quote, older lesbian convinces younger lesbian. And some of it was leaning into the predatory lesbian trope. That really isn't okay. It's one thing to have a trope you like. It's another to pigeonhole an entire identity to one or two tropes and not giving us room to tell other stories. We are the judges of the stories that we need now and we needed before, not someone outside our community. And I think a lot of this would be moving faster and smoother if, at every turn, publishing didn't keep putting in white cishet people in senior positions and other positions of power. I'm very happy that there have been reports of a handful of BIPOC acquiring editors and there has been a growth of queer agents, but it's not enough. It's not going to be enough until publishing is as diverse on a corporate level as it claims it wants the stories it pushes out to be. Furthermore, there still isn't really a push for disabled or neurodivergent authors, still. After all of these conversations around autism and ADHD and PTSD and mental health post-COVID, we're still not being uplifted in the ways we could be. Publishing wants all of us on social media, and I think they are aware that they are going to get pushback from neurodivergent and disabled authors and aren't ready to deal with that. Marketing in general needs to fall back on the publisher. They have to start taking that responsibility back and start holding the hands of all their new authors that need it instead of only the ones that they pay big money for. Heck, I would even take a buddy system where more senior authors at the imprint or house are paired with brand new authors to help them learn how to navigate the world as an author, and publishing makes those pairings. I've heard that editors want to give more money to books that they know might be quiet. I've seen the tweets. I know Amazon is partially to blame for this. It doesn't mean I don't still think something has to give and they have to start reducing the pair of their senior officials to actually uplift marginalized creators in terms of marketing beyond a handful of us each year. And the quota thing has to go and replaced with a at minimum. This is how many queer books we have to publish a year. I'm tired of seeing Jewish authors being told that the imprint already has a Jewish book for the season. They deserve shelf space too. So stay in your lane was not, to my recollection, the message of own voices. But a lot of people took it to mean as much. When I think about the question from the original email, am I the best person to tell this story? I can definitely see how it might be interpreted that way. Like the implied answer is, well, is this my story? Then no, I am not the best person to tell this story. But that's a tricky territory because we as authors we didn't get into this to write fictionalized memoirs we got into this to write fiction i hope that at this point in the video if your reaction to all of this is just anybody can write about anything they want with no repercussions i hope you understand now that there is just a very thick history here of harmful stereotypes and negative portrayals and just lack of representation of certain communities in all of literature and that if you had experienced decades upon decades of those harmful stereotypes of people like you, you might feel differently. You would probably feel thrilled when finally an author who was from your own community wrote a book about the experience you know that you know so well and that book resonated not only with you but with lots of other readers outside of your community and showed them that your community is beautiful and rich and complex and so much more than just villain or victim or whatever so story time years and years ago uh, this was actually back when the black lives matter movement was just starting to like really get national attention i taught a workshop for aspiring authors adults who brought in the first chapter of the stories they were working on for like a quick round table assessment. And this one woman sat down in front of me with her chapter. She was a white woman in her 50s, I think. And she was very moved and outraged by the stories she was seeing in the news. And she was writing a piece of fiction inspired by one of those stories, okay? Was she the best person to tell that story? No. Obviously not. And I'm not just saying that because she was white. Honestly, I read the first chapter. Again, intentions in the right place, but it was riddled with stereotypes because she had only just begun to 
realize what had been happening in the world around her for so long and she had blind spots that she still ne needed to work through. If she'd posted that public that chapter publicly or like gotten a book deal, she absolutely would have been dragged as being a white savior profiting off the pain of black people. I will admit I kind of struggle with this because as an editor, I would not have published that book. Not, again, not because the author was white, but because I can assess as an editor from the first chapter that it just, it wasn't, it was objectively not very good. But as a teacher, do I really want to discourage a writer who is attempting to empathize with the lived experience of other people? No, I don't want to do that. This is a little bit of a side tangent, but I often see online activists who are very, their brand, their tone is to be pretty condescending, pretty patronizing to people who do not agree with them. And they are admittedly very sarcastic and entertaining and funny to their audiences who already agree with their point of view. But that tone that they choose to employ is just very off-putting to people who might otherwise actually be kind of receptive to their message. I've never met a person who responds positively to being condescended to. I don't personally think it's an effective way to advocate for a cause. And I will be the first to admit that I'm a somewhat of a hypocrite here because if you go back through probably this video and many other traditional publishing videos I've made, I am often quite sarcastic and rude, so there's that. Anyway, my point is that just flat out telling aspiring authors to stay in their lane is condescending. This is fiction. It is actually about walking in someone else's shoes. So I guess where I'm at personally right now to go back to that example of the woman in the workshop is I would not publish that book, but I would not discourage her from writing it. She can write it. She could write the whole book and she could go on submission with it if she wants to. And in an ideal world, when editors read it and the team of editors is a pretty diverse one, they will be able to assess for themselves whether or not it is authentic and a well-written story and portrayal of this particular experience and they can make their decision and it really doesn't have to do with the race of the author. It has to do with the actual quality of the book and how they assessed it. There will be no need to slap together committees of underpaid marginalized staffers or to employ sensitivity readers to do the job that is the editor's job to do in the first place. And again, I want to say like one single editor, I fully support reaching out to authenticity readers on some projects. I'm not saying publishers should never use sensitivity readers, but I think editors need to really do a check on themselves and make sure they're not doing it to shield themselves because they are afraid of being accused of being blankist or blank phobic. And they are actually doing it because they recognize, well, I think this is a great book, but you know, just to be sure, let's get some opinions, maybe, you know, from other communities to make sure there aren't some places where we can make improvements. One more side story, because I think about this a lot when this topic comes up, is even longer ago when I was teaching writing workshops for kids, I had this one girl, she was about nine years old, she was a white girl, and she was writing a story about a white family that adopted a black refugee child. And this was something she worked on all year. So we had opportunities every single week at the workshop part of the workshop for her to share and to talk about in a gentle, welcoming way about things like stereotypes and maybe misconceptions about refugees and things like that because she was nine. The story was riddled with them. But her, when I tell you her heart was in the right place, I mean, this girl frequently cried when sharing bits of her story. I don't know what inspired it. Maybe she saw something on the news. I have no idea. But whatever it was, I am telling you, it stuck with her for a long time. So was that story white savior-ish? <laughs> yes, literally the white family were white saviors in that story. But I would never tell this nine-year-old girl to stop writing it or that she needs to stay in her lane. She was empathizing. It's like the whole point of fiction, especially children's fiction. So as a teacher, I'm never gonna discourage that. Now, as for whether or not I think an author can effectively write outside of their experience and, and be worthy of publication, 
absolutely yes i truly believe that is possible and happens all the time you've probably seen some of those like funny videos and memes about female characters written by men i've told you a million times michael i can't get married right now i'm a scientist but i'm also a woman i can't be both at the same time she was not like other girls she liked pizza and raced cars she loved bathing her hands in car grease her hair falls down her back like a shiny river thank you she places the toothbrush in her mouth suggestively they are very funny and i can honestly say yes i have read some very terrible portrayals of women written by men but you know what i've also i mean some of my favorite female characters of all time were written by men. I was absolutely obsessed with Carrie when I first read it as a teenager. I love it every time I reread it. It's still one of my favorite horror novels of all time. Stephen King did not have the lived experience of being an abused teenage girl in an evangelical Christian household who is traumatized by her first period and subsequently bullied, but he sure did a great job writing it. I also want to address the idea of taking a spot from another author. Yes, it is true that every publisher, every imprint, they, are, they have a limited number of titles that they can publish every season. But as authors, first of all, there's, there's obviously no way of knowing who out there might be writing a book similar to our own. As the original emailer clarified, they obviously know that there are some trans authors out there writing stories, but that doesn't mean they're writing the same stories or even stories that are remotely similar in terms of premise or in how the story portrays a specific trans experience. And I will say this, if a book is just absolutely stellar and a publisher wants to publish it, they're not gonna use the excuse of we don't have room on our current list to reject it because if you look at book deals when they're made some of them will have publication dates as much as two or even more years out from the date of the deal they can move things around they can put some books in the future you know what i mean if they really want it that's not going to be the reason they reject it so i don't think it's always necessarily fair to accuse an author of taking the spot of another author because that truly is a hypothetical. I realized while editing this that, as other commenters pointed out, the whole idea of taking a slot from another author comes from the fact that, as we discussed earlier, publishers historically have had token spots for stories about marginalized characters by marginalized authors on their lists, which led to rejections like the example I gave of, sorry, we already have an Asian American book. In that case, yes, one Asian American author literally took the spot of another, but that is not the fault of the author. It's just one of the many broken cogs in the system that is the publishing industry, and that cog won't be fixed until publishers acquire books based on quality and not on trying to tick boxes. I am sharing the following comments because I think this perspective is completely valid. And again, I wanna reiterate these comments I'm about to share we're on the last video where I had not shared yet the full email and further correspondence from the original emailer. Kinga says, I'm going to be blunt, but I need to get this out of the way. Frankly, if you can't get through the beginning of this comment, then I don't think you should be querying this book because your ego might be too involved. And when you're dealing with writing people outside of yourself, it's best if your ego is kept to a minimum. I'm putting passion into my response because I think the emailer is someone who is willing to listen, as is whoever decides to continue reading this comment. I find this statement, but nobody else is writing it, infuriating. How do you know that? How do you know there isn't a single bisexual trans woman out there writing the same story as you? Maybe it only looks that way because someone of that identity hasn't had the chance to publish that book yet. I find the implications of that comment to be a touch egotistical, but I'm being blunt because as I stated previously, keeping the ego to a minimum will be best in this situation. It'll be much easier to figure out what to do with the story once you take yourself out of it. I'll cut some slack on, but still point out the what about my comfort vibes coming off the questions from the first paragraph of the screenshot since I agree that the, those are important questions to ask oneself. But I don't think that's the most important question to ask in this situation. From the looks of the screenshot, it seems like like this was taken from the end of the email the person sent so perhaps the emailer has already talked about what i'm going to discuss which is am i really the best person to tell this story it's a fantastic question and i hope that every writer asks themselves this when creating their work so what if there is a bisexual trans woman who is writing a similar story to yours what if there is anyone of the marginalization you're trying to represent writing a similar story to yours should you just give up there's no place for your book to belong you shouldn't bother writing or querying it i don't think so 
Personally, I find the whole sentiment of nothing is original, why even bother trying, idiotic. If you give a group of 10 writers the same message to have in their book, they're going to write 10 different books. And the glorious thing about that is those 10 different books will resonate with readers to varying degrees. Maybe a reader won't see that message in the first or second or third book that they read from this set of novels, but it's the fourth book that they read where that message finally sinks in. All of those previous books were necessary to read. They were all sowing seeds for the message to bloom and be understood. Who knows, maybe for one reader, it's a book they hate that will make the message sink in. It alleviates a lot of pressure to get things right and make it palatable for your widest possible audience. Your only responsibility will be to do your best to communicate the message you want. So what if someone of a marginalization you're trying to represent is writing a story similar to yours? Are you really the best person to write this book if that's the case? That depends. Do you really need to be the best person to write this book? Not every book needs to be a paragon of perfection. In fact, none of them can, but that doesn't mean we can't try our best to make the best product we can. In that case, ask yourself, what do you bring to this story? In this instance, maybe the emailer can't speak much to the trans woman experience, but she can speak to her experience as a bisexual woman while keeping in mind that as a trans woman, things might be different and to do research and hire sensitivity readers. Maybe the characters of both authors, authors have had the same hobby, like playing video games, but the emailer has a lot more experience with video games and is more familiar with that culture. That doesn't mean that the bisexual trans woman shouldn't write her book. I don't think any of us are stupid enough to believe that. It just means that both books are going to be different and appealing in different ways. Like if you fail miserably at representing trans women, people who hate trans people might love your book and maybe don't try to intentionally appeal to them. Ultimately, I think it's best to focus on the similarities you have with your characters by highlighting them and doing due diligence for your differences. Finally, I offer resources. I think anyone who shares the emailer's concerns should read the article, How Not to Be All About What It's Not All About. Further thoughts on writing about someone else's culture and experience by Nisi Shaul on tour. There are several strategies that Shaul recommends in order to figure out what to do with a story where you're not sure if you're the right person to write it. I apologize for recommending another YouTube channel, uh, Michelle here, absolutely no reason to apologize for that. But Bookish Whelm's video, Should White Authors Write About BIPOC Experiences, is also insightful, along with the articles linked in the description. I realize that this question is pertaining to the LGBTQIA community, but I think the insights shared in that video are useful for anyone trying to include people outside their communities in their story. And again, Michelle here, I will include these links in the comments below. Hunter says, the forced outing of personal characteristics is important and needs to stop. On the other hand, just because we don't see someone writing a story out there doesn't mean the stories aren't being written. To take the example from the email, there are trans women writing novels, but they are not getting that many novels published. If publishers treat certain identities as we've already done that this year, then it is unfortunately true that a person not of the identity has taken the place of a person of that identity. However, of course, the real solution is for publishing to change, but if they haven't, what do you do? I've never known. There are just so many issues in this and the this comment can't be a dissertation. Main point, not seeing does not equal not existing. The Geeky Librarian says, I think anybody can write trans characters, even though they are not trans themselves, as long as they do it in a respectful manner. Sensitivity readers are something a lot more authors should use. But when it comes to the query letter, I have no idea how to phrase stuff, because what I see from others' experiences is that it's really hard to get books with characters that are trans, for example, published, and maybe even more so if you are not trans yourself and they cannot use you in the marketing, and that sucks. Victoria says, I feel like most of the own voices discourse should belong to readers and reviewers and not publishers. I just find it so odd for someone to use your identity as a marketing term. It's completely different for a reader, especially a young reader, who shares the identity of someone in a book to be curious about the identity of the author. It's a genuine curiosity and wondering if someone is the same as you instead of a question of whether someone is valid enough or worthy to tell the story. I also don't think there's anything wrong with not wanting to read a book because you're skeptical of the author's ability to tell an authentic story as long as you leave said author alone. Don't critique the book before reading it or bully the author off the internet. When I look for books that represent people outside my own identity, I try to look for reviewers from that specific identity and see their opinions on the books, but I don't know how that involves the publisher at all. Just wanted to add that these conversations function very differently when it comes to representing different things, gender, sexuality, race, disability, socioeconomic status, etc. I think the skepticism comes from previous patterns of being dehumanized and misrepresented and different communities have experienced that harm in unique ways. I feel skeptical of certain books because I don't know for certain if that author will see me as human, but if an author shares that identity, that feels guaranteed. Of course, anyone can make mistakes, but because of that baseline, I just feel like I trust them more. 
I'm not sure that's the right phrasing, but that's kind of the sense I get from other people. So if at this point in the video you are kind of thinking that I'm kind of saying, oh, us poor white authors being told we can't write about non-white people or something like that, one, that is not what I'm saying. Two, as the original email illustrated, it is as always, marginalized authors who are the most hurt by this weaponization of own voices. I'm pretty sure I told this story on another video, I don't remember which one, but a long time ago I was on a panel with a debut author. The author was from a marginalized community and their debut did center that experience. During the panel, the author showed us the cover for their second novel and the cover featured a white girl. The author talked a little bit about their inspiration for like the premise of the story and then said, I chose a white protagonist because I refuse to be pigeonholed by my publisher into being the marginalized author who writes about this specific marginalized experience. And that was the first time I personally realized that this was a thing that was happening. This was before all the stuff started coming about, out about agents and editors weaponizing own voices, rejecting authors when they find out that the story is in own voices, and encouraging them to apply again if they choose to write an own voices story instead. In these conversations about whether or not it's okay to write outside of your lane, someone will usually make the good point that it depends on whether that marginalization is like at the core of the story or whether it's just an incidental part of who that character is. For example, if the main character is gay, does the story focus on is it like their coming out story or them dealing with some specific kind of homophobia? Or is it a fantasy story about a quest to save the world from a dark lord and the character happens to be gay? In other words, is it an issue book or is it escapism? Now I am not a, you know, in a position of authority as I made clear here, but I would never sit here and tell you that you can't write an issue book if you have not experienced that issue. I will say if you choose to do so, you have your work cut out for you. And I completely understand that a lot of people in marginalized communities who are so beyond exhausted of seeing lazy, harmful portrayals of themselves in media and in books would just be like, it's a hard no for me. I get that. Reader's choice, I respect it. Escapism stories tend to get a lot more slack. I mean, I have a paranormal trilogy about a biracial girl and I've never seen at least any criticism specifically based on like, you shouldn't have ri written this because you are not biracial. Nobody ever told me I should have stayed in my lane. And that brings me to something that I would love to see brought up more in this larger ongoing conversation about own voices. A lot of marginalized authors out there want to write escapism and are being discouraged from doing so. Because when you write an own voices book, very, very often, you are drawing on past trauma, and I am not someone who uses the word trauma lightly. I mean trauma as in these authors are reaching deep down and connecting with truly horrific experiences that they or their loved ones have had directly related to their marginalization and pouring that pain into their work. There are authors who do this willingly. I mean, it could be, I hope it's in some way cathartic for them. And those stories absolutely need to be out in this world. And I, and I know tons of readers are so grateful to these authors for writing them. But if a marginalized author just wants to write a sappy rom-com or a dragon epic fantasy or a gory slasher and not really touch on those issues at all, they should be able to do so. And if those books are good, they absolutely deserve to be published. Not rejected with the note, hey, you're a really great writer, I love this, we don't have room for it right now, but if you ever want to write about your past trauma, please submit that. Again, that is so gross. <laughs> Daisy says, I definitely know some trans people who get angry at non-trans authors writing about a trans main character, i.e. they're taking the slot of a real trans author as though there is a quota of those types of books that be can be published, but maybe that's true? I've also read books by cis heterosexual women about gay men who didn't seem remotely realistically gay, but perhaps those books weren't for gay men to begin with? Many people say they want diversity in books, but I feel for authors who include a diverse cast but are knocked for not perfectly representing one of those cast members. 
In TradPub, money should flow to the author, or so we're told. So it doesn't seem right that the author has to pay out of pocket for sensitivity readers. But will publishers pay for them? Just curious. I question myself, as an Asian writer, whether or not my main characters can only ever be Asian or default to white. Personally, I think it depends on the book. I'd personally prefer to read about the Asian experience by an Asian author, but if a book with an Asian main character isn't about the Asian experience, but a fantasy or mystery or whatever, then it doesn't even occur to me to consider the race of the author. I feel wishy-washy as I think about all this, but I guess that's why it's such a tough question. Jennifer says, For me, it depends on the type of book. Yes, authors should be able to write with all sorts of characters and relationships and identities. As an asexual individual, I will basically have to write outside my lane, as romantic subplots are basically a requirement in the fantasy genre that I want to write in. But for me, the line is that if you are specifically writing a book that explores what it means to be a member of that marginalized community, then you should be able to claim that identity. Example, I am a white, asexual female who believes that it is okay for me to write a book where a POV character is a black gay man, but I also believe that I am not the person to write a book exploring what it means to come out and live in the world, real or fantasy, as a black gay man. This comment from Tanya, again, was one that was sent before I shared the entire email and the follow-up, so Tanya does not have all of the details that I shared in this video. Tanya says, I feel like the letter writer is talking about two different things. You're allowed to disclose whatever you want to disclose, but I'd have her really examine why she's hesitant to disclose that she's a cisgender woman. In the bio statement, it's as easy as saying, I'm a cisgender woman living in XYZ. By the nature of her book, people looking for representation are going to assume she's trans. They just are, it's human nature. If she wants to get ahead of that, she might want to consider disclosing. Criticism may come from it, but actual harm likely won't come from disclosing your cisgender. And I think all authors should be able to take criticism of their work in ideas. If she's not disclosing because being cis may not sell her book, that feels less awesome. As for her second issue, is she the right person to tell this story? She's the one who came up with the story, so yes. Ashley at Bookish Realm did a great video on the topic with supplemental articles that gave me food for thought. I'm a black bisexual woman, but I have people from other marginalized identities in my book. Basically, what I took away from the video and articles was that if you have a real reason, either personal or story-driven, for the characters maintaining those identities, and it's not just pasting an identity on for diversity, diversity's sake, you, then you'll be fine. Be open and honest and willing to take criticism and feedback, and it's no big deal. I have a writer friend that uses this question as an excuse to self-reject, to not put her story out there and query. Please tell the letter writer to still move forward with her book. I really don't think the writers who are aware or concerned about these issues are the issue in publishing. Blendicity says, I feel the same about the book I'm working on. Conflicted, but resolved to write the story in my heart. The idea of someone outing themselves before they're ready just to make their story more palatable to publishers and editors feels very wrong, especially given that it might not be safe for them to do so. As for writing a marginalized character who represents a group that I am not a part of, I try to accept that I won't please everyone and that some might take offense. I think you need to have a balance of humility and confidence. Be prepared to dismiss condemnation from people who are judging you unfairly, but also be willing to listen and take responsibility if you caused any real harm, even if unintentionally. Sensitivity readers can help with that, I bet. Lex says, I can't speak for the professional side of things, only my personal opinion, and I will freely admit I'm just your basic white cis female and probably don't have authority to speak on these matters, but I'm glad that you're bringing this up because continuing the conversation and hearing more voices is the only way we'll keep moving forward as a society. While I understand the argument against publishing books with perspectives from identities that aren't yours, i.e. a white author publishing a book about a culture that isn't theirs overshadowing another author who belongs to that culture, it also doesn't account for a lot of the nuances in each situation. If we continue with this example, which could apply to gender and sexual identities as well, what if the white author is very passionate about that culture and did everything possible in their power to portray it respectfully? What if they married into that culture or have kids in that culture and want to write a story as a love letter to those they care about? And if all of these offer permission to writing identities that aren't your own, how does this feed into the ignorance society still has of minority groups? How are we supposed to stop drowning out the voices of others and let them tell their own stories? I don't think there's any one-size-fits-all answer to this. They say, write what you know, but writing what we don't know is how we learn. And we all need more diverse books to read so we can keep learning and growing and having these conversations. It seems like no matter what you do, you'll face criticism. No one culture or identity is a monolith, and everyone has a different opinion, both inside and outside every minority. People will disagree. 
All you can do is be true to yourself, respectful of others, and tell a good story. Long story short, I don't think that anyone should ever be required to disclose their identity, and I wish I had more insight on the publishing side and would be interested to hear any other responses. I wish whoever wrote this email the best of luck in their endeavors. As told B says, I think that people are allowed to write characters that they have no identification with whatsoever. This can be done respectfully if the research and effort is put into it. That's why sensitivity readers exist. I think they are an investment you definitely need if you're writing outside of your identity. I don't like that you have to share something so personal and something you might not be comfortable sharing just to share a story from your heart. If you're a masochist and you really want to just get dragged by book reviewers, here is a tip. Write a YA novel featuring a bisexual protagonist. You cannot win. Your Goodreads page will be a dumpster fire. They will be mad your main character has a love interest who is of their gender. They'll be mad if the love interest is not of their gender. They'll be mad your main character even has a love interest. They will be mad if your main character has no love interest at all. They'll be mad if your MC is a slut. They'll be mad if they're a prude. They'll be mad if there was sex but no romance, romance but no sex, both or neither. And if you dare put your bisexual main character in a love triangle, they will come to your house and set fire to your cat. What was it I said earlier about not being sarcastic and condescending? Okay, so why why does this happen? It's because until very recent years, bisexual main characters <laughs> kind of didn't exist. If they existed as a side character, they were almost always portrayed with some pretty harmful stereotypes. So when these books would come out, readers, especially bisexual readers, would get so excited to finally see a book that is going to center their own experience and then be devastated when they read the book and it didn't actually completely reflect their own experience. Because here's the crazy thing, there is no one bisexual experience. There's no one black experience. There's no one indigenous experience. There's no one deaf experience or autistic experience or neurodivergent experience or trans experience, you get what I'm saying. No community is a hive mind except I guess the clone community. So I understand where this kind of anger is coming from. It's not actually at the book, it's at the industry for failing to provide any books that center characters from these communities. As a white woman in my 40s, if I want to read a book or watch a show or a movie about a white woman in her 40s, I have a lot of options. Most of these characters aren't going to like directly reflect my own life experience. But sometimes I come across one where I'm like, oh man, yeah, I, I get that. Like I, I feel that, that feels very real to me. And it's cool when it happens, but it's not like shocking. I can only imagine that if I had grown up seeing someone who was like me portrayed as a villain or, you know, a slut or a victim or whatever, and then a book came out that was own voices to my experience, I would be super thrilled. And if I read it and it didn't resonate with me, I would be absolutely incredibly disappointed. But that doesn't necessarily mean the book was a poor portrayal. It just means we need more books, more stories about all the many ways to have this one particular experience. Cynthia says, my daughter is dyslexic. In grade school, the resource teacher showed her a series. I want to say the Pony Girls Club, but that's probably wrong. But one of the three girls was dyslexic. My kid was afraid to read. She knew she didn't get it and didn't want to add to her pile of failures. But when she found something with a character that resembled her, she was interested enough to try. By high school, the gap had closed enough. She no longer qualified for resource. She had a college professor tell her she thought weird, but instead of internalizing it, she told him he taught weird. She's an adult now and she's not afraid to fail. Having those books at that age were a godsend. Kanashi says, I'd say it depends on whether the person is doing it right and doing the community of the minority or the marginalized community they're writing justice. As an example of a different minority, one I can speak on because I'm part of it, is the autistic community. I would say we need more artistic characters and while I do believe it should be actually artistic authors writing these stories, if it's done right, I wouldn't object to a neurotypical, aka not autistic or otherwise neurodivergent author writing these stories if they know they're the only one to write this specific book. I'm okay with that. What I'm not okay with was this parent of an autistic kid that wrote this book that they believed only they could write to give representation and a voice to autistic people like their child so that they, the child, could understand where they, and in essence all autistic people, from what the author said, belong in the world. Sounds good put like that, right? 
Except for the fact that the author constantly used every character to belittle, bully, infantilize, and abuse the autistic character, and made the struggling neurotypical side characters that have to put up with the main character's autism the actual heroes of the story that they said the main character would die without. Essentially, the author wanted their kid to know what a burden they were, and made this story to say how autistic people ruin families by being autistic. Pretty much words right out of the Autism Speaks handbook. And that, quite obviously, was not how to do representation of a marginalized group. So long story short, so long as this person and others asking the same question isn't using their story to do a hit list, and they do this character and the community it represents justice by giving accurate and respectful portrayals, I'm all for it. But that's just my two cents. So what is my advice in terms of should I disclose this part personal part of myself to an agent or an editor or not. I think this is probably going to be a letdown, but the best I can tell you is if you're comfortable with it, go for it. If you're not, don't. This is not a required component of a query letter or submission. And if you think you've written something where the agent or the editor is going to expect that you identify with your main character in some way, well, make them ask. Put the onus on them. Because then they have to sit and think about how they're gonna say it. Hey, are you biracial? Hey, are you gay? Hey, are you trans? Hey, have you been diagnosed with a learning disability? Hey, have you dealt with depression? My hope is that having to ask will at least give some of them pause to think about what they're doing and how wrong it is. Because everyone has a right to privacy and that includes authors. You will no doubt run into some agents who are treating own voices like a trend, and they will reject you if your identity does not perfectly match the identity of your main character. And believe me, I understand firsthand right now how hard it is in the query trenches. And I understand if you don't want to take an otherwise awesome agent off your query list if you feel like that might happen with them. But I will just say this, if you are uncomfortable with what an agent asks you to disclose, and you decide to disclose it anyway, just be prepared for the fact that it's almost certainly not going to end there. By which I mean you will also have to disclose it in your submission package and you might have to disclose it to the marketing team and to the publicity team and to your readers at large in interviews and panels and the like. Also, I have to say, because I always try to end these bleak videos on a positive note, there are so many amazing agents and editors out there who will be 100% willing to listen to you and your concerns here. And I also have to say, while the publishing industry is just not nearly as diverse as it, we would like it to be and as it needs to be, it is not 100% homogenous either. There are agents and editors of color who are from the LGBT community, who have disabilities, who are neurodivergent, and anxiety and depression and mental illnesses. Yes, I mean, th there are agents and editors out there who have lived these experiences. And many of them are no doubt having these conversations internally at their houses and at their agencies. I say this as always because if traditional publishing is the path that you want to go down, I never want to discourage you from doing so. I just want you to feel armed and better prepared to walk that path. Thank you for sitting through this mammoth video, and especially thank you to the person who sent the original email and agreed to let me share it so we could have this conversation. Thank you to everybody who commented on the last video, and I am looking forward to continuing the conversation.